on behalf of curry leaf and other organizers uh, manmohan and kirtana welcome you all to the student seminar 2021 so uh, uh, i hope that uh, this student seminars will provide you a platform to share your knowledge and uh, understanding of your uh, mathematics with us and uh, but more importantly what i would like to uh, see is how you inculcate the spirit of mtts in your uh, learning of mathematics and how you share it with us so and uh, one thing that i really like and love about the student seminar is that uh, the students become the teachers and we all learn from each other right so uh, with this i now welcome uh, somyo there the chair of today's session and uh, somyo is currently a postdoc at math science chennai so over to you somyo yeah uh, thanks kiran for the introduction uh, welcome everyone very good morning uh, today in this uh, vssp 2021 we have the first speaker uh, sakshi suv from uh, shivnadar university and uh, she is a third year bsc uh, research mathematics student and uh, she attended recently uh, level o of batch 2 and in mbts 2021 and she will be speaking on existence of a monotone subsequence of a sequence yeah sakshi you can uh, share your screen so hello everyone uh i am sakshi shop and um, so uh, by now almost all of us uh, have encountered sequences in one way or the other uh in today's presentation i'll be uh, discussing a main theorem related to sequences that uh, says that every um, sequence has a monotone subsequence that is existence of monotone subsequence of a sequence before starting off uh, with the main theorem uh, let's uh, discuss uh, what monotone sequences are so first of all what is an increasing sequence uh, a sequence xn is increasing if for every n in the set of natural numbers xn is less than or equal to xn plus 1 sakshi so uh, what Yes, so yeah, now we can see. Yeah, the the slide was not changing. Okay, all right, please go. Okay. Yeah. So uh, now, what is a strictly increasing sequence? So as it's clear from the context, a sequence x n is strictly increasing if for every n in n x n is strictly less than x n plus one. Okay, thus the inequality changes to a strict inequality. Analogously, what is a decreasing sequence? So a sequence y n is decreasing if, for every n in n, y n is greater than or equal to y n plus one. And so, what will a strictly decreasing sequence be? So a sequence y n is strictly decreasing if, for every n in n, y n is strictly greater than y n plus one. Now, suppose you have any given sequence, say a n. Now, if a n is either increasing or decreasing i am including the strictly increasing case in the increasing and the strictly decreasing case in this decreasing so if a given sequence is either increasing or decreasing we say that that sequence is a monotone sequence so a sequence is monotone if it's either increasing or decreasing now let's look at uh, one example so if you consider the sequence an equals n n is a strictly increasing sequence and hence it is monotone why is it so because for every n in n what we get here is that an is strictly less than an plus 1 right now what does not qualify to be a monotone sequence if you consider the sequence r2 r2 and so on then it's not increasing why is it not increasing because if you look at the second term it's 2 the third term is 1 and 2 is greater than 1 so it's not increasing now if you look at the third term and the fourth term the third term is strictly less than the fourth term so it's not decreasing either hence what we conclude from this is that this given sequence is not monotone now that we have discussed what the monotone sequences let's We'll go to our main theorem of today. Okay, 
So what does this theorem say? It says that if Xn is a sequence of real numbers, then there is a subsequence of Xn that is monotone. So what we have, what we have to prove here is that suppose you have been given a sequence Xn. Now you have to find one subsequence of Xn which is monotone. And what do we do for finding a sequence? We have to find a strictly increasing sequence of natural numbers, say n1 less than n2 less than n3, so on, less than n k, and so on, right? And then we have to consider those terms from the sequence and list it, okay? That is xn1, xn2, xn3, with an additional condition that that subsequence has to be monotone here, okay? Before starting the rigorous proof of uh, this theorem, consider this situation. Suppose you have been given a sequence Xn. Keep the terms of the sequence in mind, okay? Now, suppose that there's a prediction about the eruption of a dormant volcano. Then, obviously, there will be many tourists coming to see this eruption, right? Because it was dormant since ages, and now you will want to see what it looks like. And as a result, the local business, what they did, they constructed a, an infinite number of towers in front of the volcano at a certain distance, of course. And uh, constructing infinite number of towers is, of course, not possible. But hypothetically speaking, suppose that they have constructed an infinite number of towers. Okay. Now, um, it will be better if we visualize this. So, we ha I have taken this picture from the expository article. If you look, look here, these are the number of towers. Of course, infinite number of towers cannot be drawn. But just imagine that there is a sequence of towers. And this is the dormant volcano whose eruption is predicted. Okay. Now, these towers are constructed in such a way that the height of the first tower is of height, uh, is x1. That is the first term of the sequence. I, I had told earlier that suppose you have been given a sequence. I said keep that in mind. So in uh, and the towers here are constructed in such a way that the height of the nth tower is xn. All right. So the height of the first tower is x1. The height of the second tower is x2. The height of the third tower is x3, and so on. Okay. Now. Suppose you are a, a tourist, what would you tourist like? So what you would like is that you are, whenever you are standing on the train tower, your view is clear. You are farther away from the volcano so that you don't hurt yourself. And the second thing is that your view isn't obstructed by the towers that are in front of you, right? So here, x1, x2, x3, Suppose I'm I'm saying that uh, I will give you uh, the tower X1 to stand on, okay? Will you prefer standing on the tower X1? No, right? Because your view, if you stand on X1, it will be obstructed by this tower X4. Similarly for X2, your view will be obstructed by this and same thing for X3. Now, suppose you're standing on this tower X4, okay? Then suppose that all future towers are of the of a height less than x4 okay so suppose you are standing on this tower of height x4 that is the fourth tower now you will agree to stand on this tower and see right because you have to keep the set you have to keep it that is uh, whenever i go there offer me uh the any tower number, I have to create a list of towers which are suitable for. Now I'll say that the tower for the fourth tower was suitable for us. Why was it? Any natural number k such that k is strictly greater than four, x k is less than strictly less than x four, right? That is the height of all the subsequent towers is less strictly less than x four, right? So when will uh, a tower, uh, say, nth tower, be favorable. So if you construct a set, it will be favorable. So suppose S is the set of all the favorable towers. All right. So you are considering all such n such that n is a favorable tower. Now, when is a tower favorable? When the view isn't obstructed by any of the future towers. Okay. So we say that a tower n is favorable if for every m greater than n strictly greater than n xm is strictly less than xn for all the future towers m 
the height of the mf tower never exceeds the height of the f tower only then nth tower is a suitable tower okay so now you know when do we say that n belongs to s now when do we say it does not belong to s let me go to the picture okay so here we said that x2 would be a favorable tower why because its view is obstructed because our view will get obstructed by this uh sorry the tower to mount be a favorable tower why because its view will be obstructed by the fourth tower right so it means that any tower that is not favorable it means that there is a future when do we say that a particular tower is not favorable so that tower is in favorable uh there is a future tower obstructing its view all right so it means that a tower n is does not belong to this set if there exists a tower m that is a future tower is that there exist an m strictly greater than n such that the height of the mth tower that is xm is greater than or equal to the height of the nth tower xn okay now that we have discussed uh, we have constructed this set s uh, for any given sequence uh, using uh, the uh, the uh, volcano analogy uh, the proof of the, our main theorem becomes completely mathematical okay so now let's look at the proof let xn be a real sequence what was our theorem our theorem was that every sequence has a monotone subsequence so let xn be our given real sequence okay consider the set s equals uh, the same set that we had constructed before n in uh, in the set of all natural numbers such that for every m greater than n xm is strictly less than xn now whenever you have been give, you are you are given a set there are uh, but there are major two possibilities okay there might be other exhaustive cases but uh, the major two possible cases are s is finite or s is in, infinite why did i say the cases are exhaustive because when you are considering s is finite or s is infinite there's no third possibility right it's it has to be either finite or infinite okay so now let's look at the cases one by one suppose uh, the first case is when s is finite okay so there is a natural number n which is the maximum of s since s is finite we know that there exists a maximum element of the set okay so uh, there is a maximum element of the set we name it capital n such that for every k in s k is less than or equal to capital n this is what it means for capital n to be a maximum element of the set okay now i am what i am doing is i am considering a number n1 which is strictly greater than capital n how do i know that this number exists now we know that this n1 exists because we can just take n1 to be equal to capital n plus 1 now here why we did not write capital n plus 1 that is just for the uh, sake of uh, 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 following the notation okay so now since n1 is strictly greater than capital n we know that n1 is not in s because had n1 been in s n1 would have been the maximum element right now i said that capital n is the maximum element and n1 is strictly greater than capital n so n1 is not in s all right so what does it mean as discussed earlier what does it mean for an element to be not in s it means that there is a number n2 which is strictly greater than n1 such that xn2 is greater than or equal to xn1 all right now if you look here n2 is strictly greater than n1 and n1 is strictly greater than capital n so as we know by transitive property of this inequality we get that n2 is strictly greater than capital n again by repeating the same argument we get an element n3 we know that since n2 is strictly greater than capital n n2 does not belong to capital s the set capital s okay so there exists an element n3 greater than n2 such that xn3 is greater than or equal to xn2 
element by here element uh, i mean element of natural numbers okay thus by induction we can find an increasing subsequent fraction so suppose you have a number n k which is strictly greater than capital n now n k does not belong to s which means that there exists an n k plus 1 Uh, which is strictly greater than n k such that x n k plus one is greater than or equal to x n k. All right. So if we keep on changing the values of k, we will get a an increasing subsequence of x n. And why is it increasing? Just by our construction, right? Because uh, you see that every number is uh, say x for every k, x n k is less than or equal to x n k plus one for every natural number k. Okay. So this was the case when s is finite. Now, what happens when s is infinite? Now, there is a well-known axiom for the set of natural numbers. What does it say? And uh, that is the well-ordering principle. Okay. What does it say? It says that every non-empty set of nat. Oh, oh, sorry. Every non-empty subset of natural numbers has a least element. Okay. So now there are two conditions that S needs to satisfy before we apply this well-ordering principle. What is it? S should be non-empty and S should be a subset of the natural numbers. So S is finite, so it is non-empty, and by our very construction, S is a subset of the natural numbers. Okay. So by applying the well-ordering principle, so by the well-ordering principle, we know that there exists a least element n one of Capital S. Okay. Now consider the set capital S minus n one. Okay. Now since S was infinite, removing a finite number of elements from S won't affect its infinity, right? So it means that S is again S minus n one is again non-empty, and of course it's the subset of the natural numbers. So again by the Dalton principle, there exists an element into which is the minimum of this set, right? So in such a manner, we will we can find for every k in the set of natural numbers, there will be a least element and say n k plus one for the set s minus n one n two so on till n k. Okay. Thus, by induction, we get a list of elements. We don't know what inequality they follow yet, so we just get a list of elements n one, n two, n three, and so on. Now, what I claim is that. N one is strictly less than N two, strictly less than N three, and so on. What I am claiming here is that for every k in the set of natural numbers, N k is strictly less than N k plus one. All right. How do I know this? Okay. So N one is uh at the minimum of S, right? And since N two is in S minus N one, it means that N one is less than equal to N two, right? Because N one is minimum. Now we know that n two is in the set s minus n one, so we know that n two cannot be equal to n one, and hence we get that n one is strictly less than n two. With a similar approach, we get that for every k in the set of natural numbers, n k is strictly less than n k plus one. Okay, so having uh, constructed this increasing sequence of natural numbers, one more thing we know is that all these n k's Lie in the set S. Now, since they are lying in this set S, it means that they have the property that every subsequent element is strictly less than that, right? It means that for every k in the set of natural numbers, x n k plus one is strictly less than x n k, right? So this is exactly what we discussed: is a decreasing subsequence, right? In fact, uh, a decreasing sequence, and here a subsequence. uh because uh, in fact here it's a strictly decreasing subsequence of x n okay so we we took two cases on the set s uh, say s is finite and s or s is infinite and in both the cases we found that there is a monoton subsequence of x n of any given sequence x n okay so here uh the proof is completed i will wait for a few seconds for uh, you all to retain the proof and then we'll go on to discuss two major applications of the proof uh, okay uh, sakshi can you stop at the previous slide yeah yeah case one and case two can you see the slide yeah yeah Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so shall I move forward now? Yeah, please. Okay. 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 So by, uh, whenever we discuss some major, there should be a lot of important applications of it. Otherwise, why would the theorem, right? Why would we state it if there's no application at all? So uh, as we have discussed the theorem, we're discussing now the two important applications of this theorem. But before that, uh, in the proof of these applications, I'll be using certain lemma. So let's discuss that first. So we will be using this lemma, which says that every monotone and bounded sequence is convergent. Okay. You can try on uh, its proof. Uh, it's a very simple proof, and I will leave it to you as an space. So let's go on to discuss the first application of uh, our main theorem, which is the bolzano bierstadt theorem sequences. Okay, what does it say? It says that every bounded sequence of the numbers has a converted subsequence. Okay, now if you see what extra condition do we have here apart from the conditions that were listed in our main theorem? What was our main theorem? It was every sequence has a got disconnected yeah shakshi are you there okay yeah yeah i okay so the first application of the theorem that we discussed is the bolzano bierstadt theorem for sequences, all right? Uh, it says that every bounded sequence of real numbers has a convergent subsequence. Now we have been given a sequence of real numbers. As soon as we have been given a sequence, we know that by our main theorem, that there is a subsequence, a monotone subsequence of it that exists. Suppose that sequence is X and K, all right? Now, one more extra condition that we have on this sequence here is that it's bounded. Since the sequence is bounded, it means that every subsequence of it is also bounded. Now, what do we have? We have a monotone and a bounded subsequence of a given sequence. And hence, by lemma one, we have that that subsequence converges, all right? So, hence we prove that every bounded sequence of real numbers has a convergent subsequence. And this is exactly what I have written here. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, now the second application and the uh, last, uh, the conclusive part of uh, my presentation. Before discussing that, let's uh, uh, look go through some of the lemmas that I'll be using. The second lemma is every Cauchy sequence is bounded. And the third lemma is, if a Cauchy sequence has a convergent subsequence, then the original sequence is also convergent. You can try both of uh, their proofs. Uh, they are quite interesting. Okay. Now, the last part is the second application, which says that every Cauchy sequence of real numbers is convergent. It can be proved in three uh, simple steps. First of all, have been given a Cauchy sequence of real numbers. Okay. The first thing that hits your mind is that this sequence is bounded by the second lemma. Okay. Now what you have, you have a sequence of real numbers, which is bounded. The second thing that hits your mind is now you can apply the bolzano bierstadt theorem. That was our application one. It means that there exists a convergent subsequence of this given Cauchy sequence. Right. And the Third thing and the last thing that should strike your mind is that since now we have a convergent subsequence of the given Cauchy sequence by lemma three, we know that this original Cauchy sequence is also convergent. Hence, the first thing, lemma two, every Cauchy sequence is bounded. The second thing, bolzano bierstadt theorem, which means that there exists a convergent subsequence. Subsequence, And the third thing is that since there exists a convergent subsequence, the original Cauchy sequence is also bounded. Hence, given any Cauchy sequence of real numbers, that sequence is convergent. 
this is the proof that I have written here. So uh, this was all on my part. If you guys have any question, uh, you can ask. Yeah. Thank you, Shakshi, for the nice talk. Uh, so if anyone has any questions for the speaker, please, uh, you can unmute and ask. Yeah, we'll keep this uh, these talks very informal. So, anything right. you, comes to our mind, you can ask. Don't be like uh, too formal, like the MTTS games. Sakshi is our friend, and we can ask Sakshi just as we ask our friend. One more one. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I have a small question. Like, uh, the set that uh, she has constructed for proving the theorem, so she is getting that when S is finite, um, like when he, he is assuming it is finite, then he is getting a increasing subsequence, and when it is infinite, she is getting a decreasing subsequence. But is it possible to construct some uh, set S where uh, in both cases, like it is finite or infinite, we will get either increasing subsequence or decreasing subsequence in both cases? Um, you mean to say that uh, is it possible when S is finite, can I construct uh, a decreasing subsequence, right? Uh, I am saying that uh, for the same set S, uh, is it like uh, if you construct from different set A, in which it means uh, in both the cases you will get either increasing subsequence or decreasing subsequence. Is it um, so you mean you need to change the set? Yeah, we need to change the set A. My question is clear. No, actually, it's not clear to me. Okay, I, mean, uh, I am saying that the set that you have constructed, that the collection of n in natural number that, that you have constructed. So yes. here in case one, you are getting an increasing subsequence. And in case yes. two, you are getting a decreasing subsequence. Right? Yeah. yeah. But I am asking like, uh, is it possible to construct some uh, set S where in case one also you will get increasing subsequence and in case two also you will get increasing subsequence. Well, it doesn't it depend on the sequence that you have been given? I mean, I can construct, I, I, it, it is possible that I will get an increasing, uh, decreasing subsequence. Uh, say, say, suppose your uh, entire sequence is decreasing, okay? So if your entire sequence is decreasing, then that itself is a decreasing subsequence of itself. So, I mean, uh, it's it's possible. It, I mean, it depends on the sequence, right? In the sequence that you have been given. It depends on, uh, yeah. I don't think I can say any more about it. It might be possible, but our main motive should be to generalize the case so that it works in any case. In any case. I hope it cleared your doubt. Yeah, okay. yes. Yeah, any other questions? I mean, the same proof won't work. There might be another proof I, which I'm not familiar with, but uh, in case two, I uh, the same construction that I did in case one won't work for uh, getting a, an increasing sequence because we cannot find them. Maybe, not sure. Right. Okay, let us move uh, to the next talk. Anirban. Anirban. Okay. Yes. So uh, my question is a bit similar that uh, we guaranteed that 
if xn is a given sequence then it has a convergent subsequence okay monodon subsequence but we cannot say that uh, always an increasing sequence will exist or we cannot guarantee that both increasing and decreasing subsequences will exist always so is there a sequence a type of sequence for which we can guarantee that that will have both increasing and decreasing subsequences yes uh, take your sequence to be 111111 the constant sequence no no of course there are examples but some general property such that if that property is satisfied by some sequence then it will have both increasing and decreasing subsequences um actually i didn't think about it i never really thought about it uh, you mean to say that there, there's a certain property that is satisfied by the terms of the sequence such that we will get uh, both increasing and decreasing subsequence right yes and not that i'm sure about the general property but i can give you examples of course but that's an interesting question uh, maybe actually i also have an observation regarding this can i share yeah yeah sure that maybe uh, if we can assure that no tail of the sequence xn is monotone then maybe we can have both increasing and decreasing sequences maybe i'm not sure no no tail of the sequence is monotone yes uh we understand it's, what is tail i do tail understand of, what tail is uh, but okay okay uh can you know what do you mean it. for it the tail to be not connected tail means uh, suppose xn is a sequence so and suppose k is some natural number so k tail means you omit the first k terms and take the resting terms means the sequence xn plus k is the k tail yes i'm sorry i can't hear you yeah i think shakshi has some technical problem uh, am i am i audible now yeah 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 okay okay oh that might work i'm not sure i cannot tell you so uh that might work but i'm really sure about that yes okay thank you yeah yeah priya you have some question yeah uh, i just want to ask in the case one we took s is finite and we take n as maximum of s so what if s is empty yeah when s is empty just take your n1 1 so if you take your n1 to be 1 okay you can take anything since s is empty is bounded above any number 1 So the case one will suffice, right? Yeah, the case one suffices by using same proofs. Okay. So thanks, uh, Shakshi, for attending to the questions.